And we are back on the Zero Hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. And joining me once again is my good friend, Matt Taibbi. I always look forward to speaking with him. Uh, There's always something uh, snapping to talk about, to put it mildly. So without any further ado, well, first, I guess I should tell you who he is again, uh, if you don't know. Uh, He's an author. He's a journalist. He has taibi.substack.com, which I believe is called TK News. And he is also uh, uh, a co-host on the Useful Idiots podcast. Matt, did I leave anything out? Nope. Um, I'm writing a book currently, so awesome. then that, that'll, that'll be out next year um, okay. on profiteering in the COVID era. So uh, That's a great when, topic. It's a really yes. great topic. Um, so first of all, welcome. Uh, Thanks for having me back. Good to, good oh, to see yeah. you as always. And I've felt for a long time that we ought to have like a PCORA commission for profiteering on COVID. Uh, you remember the Pecora Commission that yep. uh, looked into war profiteering. So, and, and to me, that would include everybody who's made every billionaire who's you know added sixty percent to their wealth or whatever um, should be taxed at one hundred percent. And as you know, before we get into the topic at hand, as you know, FDR proposed that he proposed one hundred percent war tax on income huh. above $65,000. This was in the during World War II. Um, I forget what he called it, a super tax. Or something. He had a name for it. But I think something like that now, a super tax would be great. But this is not why we, we gather here today, Matt Tyson. We can talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. We can talk, we can get, we'll go wherever we go. But um, let's start with this. You had written uh First of all, let me preface it this way. If it w- had been possible for me to buy stock in the word anodyne, <laughs> then this editorial by the New York Times would have made me a rich person because. Mm-hmm. New- Pardon? Yes, you're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. And this was uh, you wrote about this anodyne editorial. Um, maybe maybe you should start by uh, telling us what the editorial was. Well, it, it, it's actually sort of a sequel to an earlier anodyne uh, editorial, which I think we also talked about, which was the Harper's letter from a couple of years later, we uh, years ago, um, where a bunch of people got together and they signed a, a, a very inoffensive statement, basically in support of basic principles of free speech. They bent over backwards to say that it wasn't a problem exclusive to the left or the right. They were basically saying that uh, they they were in favor of uh, freedom of academic inquiry and of journalistic expression. And a bunch of people signed it who were famous, including Salman Rushdie, Wilton Marcellus, and J.K. Rowling, which ended up being uh, precipitating a huge mess because a number of the people didn't want to co-sign with Rowling because of her views on trans issues. And um, the whole thing ended up basically proving the thesis of the article, which was that um, people are very, very touchy about speech and there can be tremendous consequences for saying the wrong thing. Um, The Harper's letter precipitated the ouster of Matt Iglesias from Vox, who is the co-founder of the of the site. So the the New York Times, which I think is is um, making a little bit of an editorial shift uh, in recent times, probably in response to some market research that they're doing, um, you know, came out with an editorial that they had apparently worked on for quite some time. They commissioned a poll uh, with uh, the Siena Research Group, basically asking Americans um, if they had concerns about speech, if they ever worried, if they ever held their tongue for fear of repercussions professionally and um, and the numbers were were striking. I forget what they were. It was something like eighty percent of Americans were either very or somewhat concerned about uh, the speech atmosphere. And they and they wrote again that this was not a problem that was exclusive to the left. That the Republicans had also been um, engaged in activities like outlawing certain kinds of uh, academic ideas uh, at the legislative level. 
but there was an enormous amount of blowback, even worse than the Harper's letter. Uh, and, th- and this Times piece said even less than the Harper's letter did. Um, but there were people calling for mass resignations, uh, firings, the whole, the whole lot. So it, it, it was quite a fiasco. It was, uh, and, and it was anodyne, as you, as you pointed out. Everybody, everybody uh, sort of bent over backwards to describe it that way because it said so little, and yet it was somehow so controversial. You mentioned in your piece uh, uh, about the Times editorial and the blowback, you mentioned that a lot of people use the word anodyne. And since you wrote about it, I saw yet another piece using the word anodyne. So uh, that part of the uh, discussion is not dying. And I should also add, you know, for people who don't know, anodyne means harmless, sometimes intentionally inoffensive and mild in its noun form. And anodyne is uh, like a painkiller, a narcotic. And it seems to me, and that seems to me not entirely irrelevant to this conversation, Matt, because it seems to me that uh, a lot of the outrage around this editorial is a way for people to somehow tranquilize themselves against more important things to worry about. Maybe that's unfair. I don't know. But that, that's one of my reactions. Is yeah, that unfair? Uh, no, I, th- I think that's fair. Um, it certainly it certainly suggests that there's a lot of anxiety that's probably about something else because it can't possibly be about <laughs> this editorial, which says so little. Uh, y- you you might say that it's a proxy for a larger discussion about hmm. who's a bigger threat to um, you know. Uh, liberal values in America, the Republicans or the Democrats. And I think some of the anger directed toward this editorial was uh, from people who were upset that there was any suggestion that there was any comparison whatsoever between, um, the, you know, illiberal attitudes on what used to be the left uh, towards speech and what's going on in the Republican Party today. Uh, and I, I think that's possible. Uh, that, that really what they're talking about is, is um, they're upset that, they're, that there's even a comparison being made uh, between those, those two groups. And um, I get that, but I, you know, I, still calling for people to be fired over a, 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 such a tepid editorial is, is uh, indicative of something that's kind of strange in, in, in the atmosphere. Yeah. And Matt, when I wrote you about, you know, coming on the show to talk about this, I said we 90 percent agree and I can't really calibrate the extent to which we disagree. It's not much. I'll tell you that. But the one thing that I certainly agree with you about is the the proportional response, you know, the the intensity of the response to the intensity of the potential slight, it seems to me so out of proportion. I could get an argument that says, uh, you know, don't say gay bills or what as so-called. I mean, we could talk about that, too, but w- that what the right is doing is worse than what the left is doing. And, all, you know, I mean, I, I, we could talk about that. But the idea that this editorial that people, you know, smart people, writers, journalists, criti- media critics can say that the entire editorial board of The New York Times should resign uh, en masse over this. To me, it's just it just struck me that some some emotion has been triggered that is not about what we're talking about. And I should, before we go any further, tip my hand as like a diehard leftist by saying that when I read the editorial without having read any criticism of it, when it came out, my main reaction was, you know, well, where are the anti BDS laws that forbid talking about sanctions against Israel? Where are the firings of academics for, you know, pro-Palestinian positions? I mean, these to me are outright uh, concrete actions, uh, get criminalizing speech, uh, penalizing speech. It seems to me a lot bigger deal. But uh, that, I think that's where maybe or maybe not our 10 percent disagreement comes in. I, I couldn't believe that wasn't in there in an article about free speech. But I get what they're saying. Um, do you yeah, I mean, go ahead? 
Well, I, I, what I would say about that is I, I've always thought that the, although I don't think that's quote unquote cancel culture is, is a non-problem. I mean, I, I, you know, I've talked to people in academia and who've talked about Title IX complaints and some of the stuff that goes on, it blows your mind. I've seen it start to creep into the journalism world where people, um, you know, are, are, are suddenly very afraid to cover certain things, which is something I've never really encountered to this scale before. But the much bigger problem for me has to do with this idea of uh, sort of oligolo- olig- oligopolistic tech companies uh, imposing sweeping standards on speech. And um, that's not about uh, entirely about targeting the right. In fact, I, I've repeatedly pointed out that the first people um, who usually suffer in these campaigns are Palestinian activists. Right, um, right. It's groups like the Electronic Intifada uh, who tend to get blown off of Facebook or Twitter. Um, they, they're like the canaries in the coal, coal mine uh, for speech. So I, I'm in agreement with you. Um, you know, I, I think there's a tendency for people to look at those who are quote unquote free speech activists now and see that as a proxy for right wing activism. I don't see that at all. I mean, I've, I've been doing, I've been covering this for three years now and I've been, I've kind of gone out of my way to make sure that uh, the bulk of the people that I feature, I have a column called meet the censored where I talk to talk right. about people who, who, who've been kind of wiped off the internet after or lost their businesses, uh, media businesses, most of those people are on are on the left politically. Um, you know, there's no shortage of people on the right who, who one could also profile. But the bigger, the more disturbing questions to me are always um, they, they always tend to involve uh, issues of people who are trying to cover war or who are trying to do legitimate investigative reporting, and they just suddenly get zapped. Um, or the, it's, the, it's the issue of big versus small, which I think is a major problem with speech that people don't really recognize. Like, you know, YouTube after January 6th um, started going after independent videographers who had chronicled the event that day and either demonetizing their sites or removing their footage. But they allowed CBS, NBC, ABC, The New York Times... Um, to use the same footage that they have been sold by those same videographers. Ah. So, so what's dangerous about that is that there, you know, it's censorship that drives all speech through this corporate uh, filter, which I think I think is the most dangerous aspect of all of this. Yeah, I actually think it's kind of smiley face totalitarianism, and it seems to me. It seems to me, Matt, that uh, one of the flaws in this whole speech debate is that people talk about it in terms of the left and the right. I think there's a left, a kind of left leaning center and a right. And I think to me, the dominant force we're talking about here is the left leaning center willing to use what to me are our classic uh, kind of nightmare technologies, uh, not classic in the sense that they're new, but according to classic forms of censorship and suppression, they're willing to use, instead of seeing big tech as a threat to speech and, and the exchange of ideas, they see it as an instrument to crush those who disagree with them on the left as well as the right. And to me, I think we should stop talking about left and right. We should be talking about left, center, left and right with the center left in in a way right now having the most institutional power. What do you think of that? No, I I totally agree. I I think a a turning point in all this came after um, after Trump got elected and uh, specifically a group of Democratic senators these are the classic sort of center leftists you'd be talking about, right? Like people like uh, Senator Mark Warner from, right. you know, uh, or Maisie Hazano, right? Um, they invited all the CEOs of all the tech companies, sort of dragged them to the hill. And it was a carrot, it was a straight carrot and stick proposition. They had a white paper ready that Mark Warner had authored. It was 24 pages long, jam packed full of new, tough, 
regulations and taxation policies that they were ready to try to pass um, that would be basically imposed on Silicon Valley uh, if they didn't start uh, basically moderating content more aggressively in the direction that they wanted. Now, at the time, the big bugbear was Russian interference. But as we've seen, you know, this can go in a million different directions. It can be anything from, um, you know, people who are talking about alternative therapies for COVID, uh, anti-vaxxers. It could be information about the trucking protests in Canada. Um, It could be anti-police brutality activists. They were actually among the first first sites that got the big, uh, got whacked in the first wave of these deletions. So, um, yeah, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's kind of this, uh, the, the sort of center left uh, politicians who look at the problem of increased concentration in media distribution, specifically with these tech platforms, and, and they don't see it as a problem. Right. They see it as a potential uh, uh, ally that they can use to start driving uh, coverage in the dire- in a desired direction. And what's dangerous about that is like, what's to stop, you know, the next group that comes into power being Donald Trump or something worse and them using, um, you know, the, exa- the same instinct to, to, to wipe out content that they don't like. So uh, I, I think, I think they're playing with fire. This is like a classic sort of Prometheus uh, story about people misunderstanding the power of technology. You know, Matt, I was glad to see, first of all, that you had Chris Hedges on recently. Uh, you know, I, I think the world of Chris, uh, you know, he was on the program a couple of weeks ago and, um, he, as as he discussed with you and as he's written about, has, was deplatformed entirely by a YouTube out of nowhere. And I was really glad to see that in your write up of that interview, you mentioned the uh, intelligence assessment of January 2017. In other words, this was the, the Obama team, uh, intelligence team, John Brennan and so on, uh, writing up. Uh, what they had to say, I'm not going to call it their findings, but their their statements about uh, Russian interference in the election just before Trump took office. And, you know, it, it, I had a flashback of those days and uh, I did not particularly want to be a, uh, you know, a dissenter, you know, uh, particularly in, you know, when everyone was, including myself, was appalled by Trump. I really didn't take that on myself. I kind of felt like a sort of every man, every person cartoon figure scratching his head saying, well, that doesn't look right. You know, right. when the you know what I mean? When that report came out, it was there was no data in it. It was an intelligence report that was a an insult to the intelligence. And the passage you cite was the one that was like, whoa, wait a minute. I think I see something here, which was a passage that says, I want to try to remember it. Basically, it, it targets RT television now, of course, driven of a, censored off the air, but uh, Russian television as a major force in disrupting American society, which is like ludicrous because nobody had ever come up to me on the street and and said, oh, I saw you on RT last night. It never happened. But um, but somehow saying that the 37,000 people who watch RT were being exposed to uh, and then they immediately list the, the stuff you quote left wing opinions that the U.S. is, uh, you know, imposing itself militarily using drones to kill people. It's like, oh, I see where this is going. There, Fracking, the Occupy movement, right? Uh, is- corporate control. Like, yeah, it was all legitimate stuff like police brutality. Right. Uh, uh, so yeah. they were using the election of a scary right winger to immediately target the left. And I felt like the left was and continues to be too damn stupid to see it. Yeah. I mean, uh, it it was, it was kind of a bait and switch, right? The, the, the report itself was about how dangerous Russia was ostensibly because they had helped Donald Trump get elected. 
But if you looked at the intelligence assessment, mostly what they were complaining about was the influence of RT. And what did RT and what is what had RT done? The, the, the lineup of RT and look, this is a cynical calculation by the Russians. It, it, sure, there's no question what they were doing was that they were trying to highlight systemic problems in the United States. So they hired all these people who were willing to talk about that, including figures like Chris Hedges. Right. Uh, and so what were they talking about? They were talking about the, you know, the effort to to put Assange in jail, um, mm-hmm. you know, police brutality, the Occupy movement, wealth inequality, uh, environmental problems, fracking. Um, you, you know, these are all real things, right? Like the, the mm-hmm. and the, the Russians, of course, had a cynical interest in promoting those themes. But they're all, but they're not illegitimate. It's not disinformation, right? Um, right. And so, you know, if you watch RT anytime over the last ten years, and you know, full disclosure, I've been a guest. I'm, I'm assuming you you might have been at, at some yeah, point, yeah, a number too. of times, sure. Yeah, um, it, most most of the people on there, I would say, um, were were abjectly left leaning, right? Like sort of open, right? Uh, right. And and. Um, and that was clearly, you know, in the in that intelligence assessment, it was ab- abundantly clear that they were very unhappy with discussion of those themes. So, um, yeah, I mean, and, and now we have a situation where all the work that, that was done by all those RT uh, contributors, as you know, Abby Martin is another one. Right. Uh, they just removed her her entire archive from the Internet. Um, it's just gone. And none of this stuff has anything to do with Russia. Like we're talking about interviews with Noam Chomsky or right, Nils right. Melzer, right? Like these are these are sort of legitimate topics to to, to talk about. Uh, even through the prism of trying to censor Russia, I think it's an incredible mistake. Uh, you know, the the United States looks weak um, uh, shutting down RT. I think if you if you, RT was on and broadcasting uh, open propaganda about the war in Ukraine, it would make them look worse, frankly. Um, In the same way that Russia looks weak, shutting down the BBC and and VOA. Uh, So, yeah, but you're right. I think ultimately the, the, the people who suffer in all this are, are in a large part of the case is going to be left-wing activists. And it's not just the Naderite or Antifa left. You know, some of RT's hosts were Democrats, proudly Democrat. You know, Chris is not, but but uh, some of the other hosts were uh, strong supporters of the Democratic Party. So they got swept away with all of this, as well as people like Chris and Abby Martin. So uh, and what disturbs me about it is that it's not disturbing other people enough. Uh, Another dimension of this is, and this one is a real flashpoint. So if I still have my show once this broadcast, I'll be happy, is um, uh, Hunter Biden's laptop, which you also covered recently. It was, look, I get the desire to get Trump out of office. I wanted badly wanted him out of office. You did, too. But I didn't want him out of office so badly that I was willing to suspend, you know, democratic norms or freedom of speech to do it. And because then it's a it's a what's the word? It's a um, boy. Now I'm blanking out like one of the Pyrrhic victory. Yes. Thank you very much. And uh, I think to a certain extent we're seeing now Hunter Biden's laptop acknowledged to be legitimately his. And yet, you know, as you've written about and others have written about, uh, it gets um, it got suppressed before the election. Right. Yeah. And and I think people underestimate what a big deal that was. Uh, I mean, there were there were a couple of us at the time um, who were really freaking out about it, particularly Glenn Greenwald and myself, because the precedent of Facebook and Twitter uh, stepping in and kind of blocking access to a potentially impactful expose uh, with weeks to go in a presidential election um, I mean, it's extraordinary. Think about uh, the idea of that becoming the norm um, for politics in in this country. 
Uh, and it was particularly objectionable in this case because, uh, look, the, the, the New York Post went out on a, on a limb a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I, we, we can't know exactly what they had in, by, in terms of confirmation that made them feel like they could risk uh, litigation and, and everything else to put that story out there. But they, they hadn't at that point done the work of nailing down for sure that this mm -hmm. stuff was real, or at least they, they didn't show that work. So yes, there were some questions about that story. It was, it was, um, you know, it was, it was legitimate to wonder about it, but to shut it down a, and then B to parrot, this crazy story that was being circulated by uh, 50 former uh, intelligence officers, including some of the most notorious liars in our, in our recent history from, you know, J James Clapper uh, to John Brennan to Michael Hayden. These are all former CIA directors, people who'd run the drone assassination program. Who, you mean um, James Clapper, the perjurer? That James yeah, Clapper? exactly. Well, and and, and Brennan too, uh, <laughs> and uh, they signed this letter saying that this that the story had the ear the classic earmarks of a Russian dis disinformation campaign, and everybody ran with that. And yeah, I mean, uh, that precedent too is disturbing, right? Like, yeah, it, yeah. it's bad enough that we have so many of these people on television now in the roles of newsreaders. Um, you know, for, for, for it to become normal to say, well, the CIA says it's this, so therefore we're going to, we're going to go with that. Like that's, that's pretty upsetting. I mean, journalists used to have a little bit more pride than that, I think. Well, and a little bit more, uh, yeah, integrity, I guess too. But, uh, to me, the right, the way for a media, healthy media ecosystem to work in a free country is okay. New York post runs a Hunter Biden story. It doesn't look like, you know, there's no they don't offer evidence that they've nailed it down. Uh, New York Times or somebody else writes a story about it, saying the Post is asserting this. But uh, our reporter is yet to find supporting evidence. Uh, people write opposing editorials about whether it's true or not. We have a national debate out of that. We sort out the truth. It seems to me uh, that it is. I hate to throw words like this around, but it's totalitarian to live in a country where the intelligence community uh, for whom this information is a professional qualification uh, says it's not true. So we lock it out of Twitter. We lock it out of Facebook. We lock it out, including private communication. This to me is incipient the totalitarianism and everybody's yay. Why? Because their guy won. Right. Right. And, and, and in, again, they, they don't see the, the precedent of this is, is, is so troubling. Right. Um, because it may, it, it's, it may not be Hunter Biden the next time. Right. It, it, it might be right. somebody that you, that you like. That's not, that's not a good reason in my book. I mean, I think you should, you should be uh, trouble troubled on behalf of the principal anyway, um, but no, the, the, this, this was, this was really disturbing and it's also incredibly paternalistic. It's, it's, uh, for the news business to go along with it. What they're essentially saying is we don't trust our readers to work this out on their own. Like, um, right. this story, uh, in the hands of the wrong people with, uh, minds not as sharp as ours may can may over conclude that this is important um and so we we don't want you to see it if if you do hear about it, we want it, we want it wrapped in so much context that uh that you can only possibly have one conclusion about it readers hate that they end up reacting they sort of anti-react right. to that strategy yeah. and this is something that trump capitalized on enormously uh, throughout his tenure, uh, this idea that, oh, look, they don't trust you. They hate you. Um, and it's much better to be open with readers and say, look, here's here's what we know. Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. Let's all work this out together. 
that builds trust with audiences. When you do it the other way, when you when you when you hide things from them um, or show that you're afraid of information, it tends to drive them in a different direction. So it's in addition to being kind of totalitarian, as you put it, it's counterproductive. I think. Yeah, and I think it's also politically counterproductive, given that the press is largely democratic. We can cop to that as a you know I think as a given. Then it also I think reinforces the right. Or alienation is a thing. Either you know they're they're all lying. They're they're saying what they want to say. And lastly, Matt, I guess if uh, the only other thing I wanted to bring up in the context of Ukraine was, uh, which and obviously, needless to say, we're all uh, devastated by what's happening there, is the extreme bellicosity of the press. Uh, you know, Ryan Grimm shocking the White House press corps by asking the question, well, what about negotiations, which is the other thing Zelensky says he wants after 30 questions about uh, a no-fly zone that could trigger World War III. Uh, it seems to me as if the entire press on the subject of Ukraine has become, or our mainstream press, has become kind of a version of William Randolph Hearst's papers saying, we're going to start a war, you know, or, or I'm going to make this war happen, or Hearst saying, I'm going to make this war happen. It's like they're all saying that, but this time the threats are existential. Am I kind of overstating the case? No, I don't think so. I, 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 it's it's been kind of amazing to me that that whole angle of this story, the one that Ryan, the the, the question that Ryan was asking, Ryan Grimm of the Intercept was asking of Jen Psaki was was a critically important question, which is does Vladimir Volodymyr Zelensky have the autonomy to negotiate an end to the war himself? Like, can he right. turn off Western sanctions? If he doesn't, if the United States is not actively helping, because there, there's negotiations going on right now that are being mediated by Turkey and by the Israeli prime minister, among other figures, the U.S. Right. doesn't seem to be participating in those in, in those discussions. If we're not, uh, and if Zelensky isn't empowered to turn off, um, you know, all all of the the hardcore Western sanctions, uh, then. We're, Russia's essentially at war with us, not with Ukraine, and that's a that's a huge distinction. Like, uh, do we want this thing to end, uh, or do or should we listen to the reports that continue to bleed out that the United States has a strategy to continue an insurgency for uh, a length of time, knowing that it's going to damage Putin politically in an effort to bring about regime change in Russia. Um, which I think is nuts, uh, you know, as, as negatively as I feel about Putin and have always felt about him. And, and I was there in, when he came to power. Um, this idea that that's going to go, that that's going to work. Um, it's, it's the most long shot of bets, first of all. But second of all, it's, it's, it does an incredible disservice to Ukraine, which is going to have to suffer in the meantime. Um, if, if the United States is overlooking uh, and refusing settlements that might be acceptable to them, but not acceptable to us. Uh, but nobody's asking that question. All, all they're asking is, why aren't we sending more weapons and why aren't we imposing a no-fly zone? Those are the only allowable questions. The the question that should be asked is, are there, is the U.S. government using the Ukrainian people as, in effect, as cannon fodder for an anti-Putin strategy? Um well, there are a million other things I could ask you, Matt, as always. Um, it's, a, it's a fast moving target, this immediate landscape out there. But um, but we'll have to end it there again. Matt Taibbi is the co-host of, uh, of Useful Idiots. He is, of course, the author of many books, including he's writing another one now. And uh, he's also got taibbi.substack.com. And as always, Matt, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Great talking with you. Thank you, Richard. Good to see you again. Same here. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.